What we have to do is also set up the stall of what the things that we want to maintain are. And those who challenge the things that we want to maintain in the context of the Brexit negotiations to come will need to explain to the world why they want to change some of the things that Europe has delivered, but the Brexit does not have to take away. So for example, one of the issues of greatest importance to Gibraltar and to the Campo de Gibraltar around Gibraltar, and even further afield towards the north of the Costa del Sol, is not freedom of movement as understood in the context of the treaty, in the context of the treaty establishing the European Union, because freedom of movement also means to many people in the United Kingdom immigration, and that is one of the things that people say they voted against. But it's frontier fluidity, the ability to enter and leave Gibraltar in a way that is in keeping with the fact that you're moving between one country and another, but is also in keeping with the good faith and the goodwill there should be between neighboring European states, whether or not they're still members of the same commercial club, and in a way that delivers to the people who need to cross that frontier no more hurdle or obstacle than is necessary for the security of each of those nations. It is true that for the people of Gibraltar, leaving the European Union is ending a dream that mattered to us. We delivered the best result in terms of positive response to the European project on the morning of the 24th of June that was delivered throughout the United Kingdom. Probably the best result that you will get in any constituency, in any vote on whether the European Union should continue to exist or not, was achieved in Gibraltar. What has the Council given us back? A slap in the face that would turn even the most Europhile into a Eurosceptic going forward. That's not the way to do European politics, and I appeal to Mr. Tusk and those in the European Council who look to make firm the negotiating guidelines of the European Council in the process of the negotiations to address again what it is that these negotiations are about. The European Parliament has not put in such a term in respect of its negotiating parameters. The European Commission has not put in such a term in respect of its European parameters. When I met Michel Barnier with the Attorney General and the Deputy Chief Minister some three years ago, I was told that he had a fierce reputation as a man who was very pro-Europe and very protective of the single market. We went in there with the reputation of a small jurisdiction that had not transposed, transposed its European obligations uh, when due uh, for some time, being able to tell him that we were the jurisdiction in Europe that was most up to date in respect of the transposition of European Union directives um, and regulations. Immediately after Brexit, uh, what we witnessed was a very sharp and visible increase in the number of inquiries from citizens concerning the UK. People are very worried. They do not know what to expect. They are very frustrated. Then, because we are also a membership organization and we have members like citizens advice bureaus that advise citizens directly, they have come to us and asked us to do something in order to shed a bit of light of what might the different post-Brexit scenario mean in terms of an impact on citizens' rights. Because at this very point there were already some speculation what would it mean in terms of an economic impact, in terms of financial flows and everything. However, immediately after Brexit, no one was raising the issue of the citizens' interest. The word border has a, a meaning in Gibraltar that I suppose could only be compared with the word border in Ireland. Uh, when you go across Europe because borders have generally been removed, the word border doesn't have the same sense of residence any longer, fortunately and positively. However, when I, when I come here, almost everyone is talking about a border. In some sense, it's constantly part of, of the way of life and the way of thinking, and has been such a central part of, uh, of the political circumstances under which Gibraltar has existed. In Ireland, of course, we've had our border. We still have our border. And Brexit promises to perhaps cause uh, a reintroduction of a border, a border that uh, has certainly divided the island physically, uh, but has divided people and minds. Uh, we're afraid that Brexit might bring back this tension of border. This study is structured essentially in two parts. The first part looks into Brexit and how different scenarios 
can impact uh, the rights of citizens. As Asia was mentioning, we have um, decided we decided to take uh, the most representative scenarios um, based on, um, on arrangements that the UK, uh, the EU, sorry, currently has with uh, non-EU countries. And this does, of course, not exclude that other deals can be can be agreed upon um, as negotiations start. Um, so the first uh, scenario is the full EU membership, which obviously is not really a realistic scenario nowadays, but it was included in the study for comparison purposes as the baseline scenario. The second scenario is the Norway's model, which is um, essentially a membership of the European economic area, namely the, the single market. The third scenario is the Switzerland model, which is based on bilateral agreements with the European Union. The fourth model is the model of Canada, which is based on a comprehensive free trade, free trade agreement with the European Union that was recently approved. And the last scenario is Turkey's model, which is based on an association agreement with the European Union, which establishes a customs union. And the second part um, uh, of the study looks into the implications that Brexit will have uh, in terms of access to EU funding by UK based and there obviously there is obviously no best alternative to EU membership under which all the rights that EU citizens uh, are currently uh, enjoying, so EU citizens in the UK and UK citizens abroad can be fully um, can be fully secured. So doing the negotiations, um, so a choice will have to be made as to which of those rights that I was just referring to are important and should be preserved and how to find um, a model that would, would, would be able to capture them. But in any case, as Asia was mentioning, whatever the choices are made, uh, we think as a citizens-driven organization that they should be arrived at in close consultation with citizens and not be driven solely by, by governments. Last year, Gibraltar voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union. It was a resounding 96% vote from a people who have always consider themselves proudly a part of the European family. We now found us, find ourselves in a position where we did not want to be. It is particularly painful for many of us as members of a government that has sought over the years to promote Gibraltar in Europe and Europe in Gibraltar as a matter of political philosophy. It is difficult to overstate the importance of a fluid frontier for the efficient running of Gibraltar and for the economic development of the surrounding region of Spain. This is not a secret. Around 12,000 people, approximately half the rock's working population, cross the border every morning in cars, on motorbikes, and on foot. In the evening, those same 12,000 return to their homes in Spain. About 7,000 of the 12,000 are Spanish nationals, the rest being a combination of practically every other EU nationality. Thousands of nationals of different member states have chosen to live in one part of the Union and to cross an internal EU border to work freely in another. This is what Europe is all about. It cannot be to put at risk by pandering to the narrow and illegal interests of Spanish nationalism. In addition to this, there are 10 million tourists who cross the border every year, mainly day trippers coming down from the coastal of soil. These generate economic growth and activity in Gibraltar, which in turn results in the creation of employment for residents and for frontier workers. In the last few weeks, a tightening of all Schengen borders has given Spain every opportunity to intermittently inflict delays on everyone crossing into and out of Gibraltar by the land frontier. There is no justification for systematic checks on every person here. The importance of a smooth running frontier to this part of the continent is plain for all to see. Studies have shown that Gibraltar accounts for 25% of the GDP of the neighboring region of Spain. Gibraltar PLC, those 12,000 jobs, make us the second largest employer for the entire Spanish region of Andalusia, after its regional government. Post-Brexit, 10,000 EU nationals will still be crossing what will become an external border, and those people will still enjoy EU rights. On a positive note, there are solutions too. There are special arrangements in existence which regulate the entry and exit of workers, tourists and residents 
between the Schengen area and some European micro-states. There may be opportunities to access Schengen. The local tra frontier traffic regulation of 2006 provides a framework for special border crossing arrangements between EU and non-EU countries. Indeed, Spain itself provides such special arrangements for border crossings into and out of the North African territories of Ceuta and Melilla. The truth is that the basis for a solution to frontier fluidity already exists if there is political will to implement it. The draft council guidelines almost provide Spain with an additional veto, a second bite at the cherry. I say this because Spain will enjoy the original veto in common with all the other member states and then a second veto in relation to the application to Gibraltar of any aspect of the UK-EU agreement, or at least that is the proposal. The use of such a wording by the Council was therefore unnecessary. It was tactless and insensitive as well, particularly against the background of the 96% remain vote in Gibraltar. The European Parliament's own guidelines, which make no direct reference to Gibraltar, are more sensitively and accurately worded. Gibraltar has never belonged to the EU Customs Union, nor do we enjoy freedom of movement in goods. We levy import duty on goods coming in from the EU and even from the UK itself. No changes are foreseen to this system post-Brexit. We have been working, as I said earlier, extremely closely with UK ministers to ensure that Gibraltar get its share of any post-Brexit trade deals that the UK may sign up to with countries around the world. Our departure from the EU will result in a loss of EU funding. We have received about 20 million euros, 60 million euros in EU funding since this was first made available in the 1990s. And so it is obvious that an orderly, sensible and well-managed Brexit is in the best interest of the United Kingdom and of the European Union. It is also in the best interest of Gibraltar and of Spain. Madrid cannot continue making poor, illogical and ill-founded arguments with respect to Gibraltar. This behaviour is not in anyone's interest. Already the border was the big issue at the time and as you've heard from the Chief Minister and the Deputy Chief Minister this morning, it remains the big issue with Brexit as well. Um, it is very important for us when we go forward now in the negotiation, or when the UK goes forward in the negotiations uh, on Brexit, that we secure a satisfactory solution to the border. It is the, by far, the main issue that arises to Gibraltar from the Brexit negotiations and from the UK's withdrawal from the EU. It is the vital artery of our economy, whether it's because over almost 50% of our workforce are uh, cross-frontier workers, important sectors of our economy like financial services and online gaming depend to a large extent on frontier workers. Online gaming, for example, 60% of the workforce are uh, cross-frontier workers. Our health and care services depend to a large extent on cross-frontier uh, workers as well. And indeed, all our goods are imported by land, or the vast majority of our goods are imported by land through the border. So it's the critical issue for us, there's no doubt about that. And when we talk about the border and when we talk about uh, free movement, as the Chief Minister and the Deputy Chief Minister said this morning, it's important that we draw the distinction of what we mean by that compared to what it means in the UK and the debates that led to the to the result of the referendum in the UK where free movement was such a big issue and such a big reason for the, for the leave vote of the referendum. I think uh, we can move on now to, to talk about uh, matters which are closer to the citizen and in that sense we have a panel here today which, which is an outstanding panel 
of people who bring a very different background to important issues which concern the citizens. Uh, now just on the issue of free movement, I think um, as a party we have a, a forward-looking approach to migration, I would say, which is to say we accept that we live in a global economy now and that global globalization means that people move more than they did previously. And while some people are threatened by this, my own view is that it's not something that can be reversed and it's something that must be accepted and managed rather than reacting by pulling up a drawbridge or building a wall or whatever else it is that some politicians are suggesting to people. I think this, this use of the politics of fear to build a sort of mentality of barricades and boundaries is understandable but extremely unhelpful. And so one of the things Greens did throughout the referendum campaign and that we're continuing to do is to defend the principle of free movement. I mean, we are fighting Brexit and we are fighting for a ratification referendum at the end of the deal because we are very clear that people did not vote on the basis of what will actually come out of the negotiations. So people voted on the basis of a series of promises, very few of which can be fulfilled, and therefore it's essential when British people see what Brexit really means that they have the right to choose between that real future, possible future, and the possible future of staying in the European Union. So we are fighting for the right to have a ratification referendum that compares one real future with another real future, as opposed to voting on the basis of a, a fantasy, effectively. But that's a, that's a hard battle, one that we'll fight, but we certainly can't guarantee that that will happen. And given that, I think it's really important that we also fight over the kind of Brexit that we could be seeing. Because Theresa May's government is going for what they call hard Brexit outside the single market, outside the customs union. Now, people did not vote for that on the 23rd of June last year, and she has no mandate for this hard Brexit. We're now going to go into a general election, and part of that will be about Theresa May trying to reinforce her vision of this hard Brexit for the United Kingdom. And it's the hard Brexit that really poses problems for Gibraltar. We go down the route where we say, we will leave the European Union, but we will continue to be part of the single market, then the problems between Gibraltar and Spain will be greatly eased. And I think that that's something I'm fighting for for all sorts of reasons, because a hard Brexit will damage businesses, because it will undermine employment law and environmental law that I think is really important. But also in terms of the borders, both at Gibraltar and in Northern Ireland, the soft Brexit option of staying within the single market would really ease those tensions. But for the university, for education in particular, it had a great deal of uh, repercussions, especially for a very vulnerable university that had just opened its doors. Uh, for us, we were starting to form our strategic lines. We were beginning to formalize the, the, the areas of study, the research intensive work that we were beginning to undertake. And we were expecting a minimum of 30% of our income. We were looking at well over 2 million a year coming from the European Union in terms of research funding. And our early success with the European Union Horizon 2020 indicates that perhaps that figure was even conservative. So we were doing so well that if we remained within the European Union, much of our income was very likely to come from the research intensive work and the partnerships that we could have formed across Europe. So you can understand that that change of landscape, that moving of the ground for us, was, was quite a shock. Um, but it's not catastrophic. Because we are early age, not, you know, on one sense you could see it as making us more vulnerable, but on the other sense, it actually makes us far more flexible because nothing was set in stone. So it's still early days for us, and it allows us to reshape and rethink our strategic lines. Uh, the one thing that hasn't been highlighted yet is that the reason that the border opened in 1985 was because Spain wanted to join the EU. That shows how critical the EU has been to the fluidity of the border, or the border, in fact, working. Um, and when I say the fluidity of the border, I say that with a pinch of salt, uh, because the fluidity of the border has been hindered at very many, uh, on very many occasions. And that's why I think the Gibraltarians are skeptical when they're told that a, soft Brexit, a softer Brexit uh, might mean an easier border. 
we've had a border where we've been, the two countries have been full members of the EU, and we've seen the difficulties that this has caused in Gibraltar. So every Gibraltarian understands the impact that any kind of Brexit will have on the border. Through my involvement in the GFSB, one of the main things that we've been able to pull together is the cross-frontier group. The cross-frontier group shows two sides of a frontier or border working together. The cross-frontier group is members of the trade unions in Gibraltar, members of the business sector in Gibraltar, joining together with members of the Spanish uh, trade associations and the unions in Spain to come together to give a message of unity. We have Spaniards saying exactly what we're saying. We're singing from the same hymn sheet as all of the um, as all of the Campo de Hiberta area. So it's in Spain that delivers a very important message. The tragedy of Brexit here is that notwithstanding the political problems that exist, when you look at what, how EU law works in this area, it is literally a textbook example of European integration. It is what Europe was set up for, and it is what we have achieved here notwithstanding all the political problems, and that's a real tragedy. We give to Spain labor, we give them jobs, and we give them wealth creation and expenditure, things which they don't have. And they give us space, and they give us labor, which we don't have. And we complement each other to create a higher standard of living and complementarity between us, which is precisely what Europe was set up for. So if this ever comes to any kind of fruition, it wouldn't be only for the UK citizens, so in my view it shouldn't be. If you want to ensure equal treatment, then you have to be able to provide this associate citizenship to everyone who actually meets the conditions for it. Because we have another region in, in, in Europe, which are the Balkans, and which have been negotiating for, for years. I mean, they, they will be, I guess, the first to ask, okay, why are you giving something to people that voted to leave and not to us that we, you know? So it should be a, 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 an even playing field. And if so, I would suppose that it will have a much, much bigger implication and application than only for the UK case, and in this case, if this is the case, then I don't see uh, any any room for Spain to veto whatsoever. But again, this is like in the, in the area of speculations. Uh, still. I don't want to um, pour cold water on an idea that's giving people some comfort, but on the other hand, I think it's really important that we don't give people false hope. And we have taken a legal opinion within our own group here, and the legal opinion says that within European law, citizenship arises as a result of your membership of the nation state and your European citizenship rights um, are dependent on that. So if you're a third country, you no longer have rights of European citizenship. So European citizenship is something that we feel that we have rather than something that we have in law. And from a Green perspective, we our, our policy is that citizenship should be based on um, contributions and residence rather than on where you were born. So we would seek to change the, um, the actual treaty law in that way. But unless something happens that invents a new category of European citizenship, then there is not any such legal category as associate citizenship. associate with Brexit, but it's a very real area. Uh, over 60% of the passengers who land in Gibraltar go over directly to Spain. Um, our fuel aviation fuel comes largely from, from Spain. There are a lot of issues uh, which arise uh, as a result of Brexit and the airport. Needless to say, the example you've given is by far the most serious and the most worrying one. We will have, this will have to form part of agreements and discussions in the period going forward now. I mean, that's, I think, all we can say about it. The aviation industry will forecast and schedule flights in advance. So you have the likes of Michael O'Reilly from Ryanair who is threatening to take away business of the United Kingdom because the United Kingdom cannot guarantee what, um, on the regulatory aspect, what freedoms and the fact that they can fly in and out of the United Kingdom in advance. So we'll be looking at, in early 18 at what's happening in 19 summer 19 and nobody can guarantee what's happening there and 
and the aviation industry, and we are involved, uh, apart from managing the terminal, and we also look after managing capital interest in aviation, and we've been to Brussels, we've been to all the workshops we've been able to in the United Kingdom for this, and it's the whole of the industry is trying to get an agreement in advance, but Brussels won't do that, and uh, they are, they're holding on, and I believe they will they will hold on until they have all the, all the strings tied up, to be perfectly honest. In Switzerland before, they went through this ordeal, they thought it was going to take two years, it took ten, I think, or twelve, and that was nearly shut down at the end of it, uh, right from the end, had nothing to do with aviation. So it's quite clear the package is not going to come until it's all signed, sealed, and delivered. I can see some sort of uh, interim agreement to ensure that businesses continue operating. I also don't see much changes on the technical aspects, because even for the countries that are remaining outside, like Norway you've mentioned, they will still comply with EU legislation on safety and security because it's in everybody's interest to do so. So the morning started with the Chief Minister and he said that the very day after Brexit he carried on with his life as normal and I think to a certain extent we all did as well because we had no option. But it was a day I think where those of us who did not sleep um, got up to got, got up and started our day with a sense of fear, a sense of trepidation. As time progressed, I think that changed to uh, the typical Voltaire resolve, we're going to get over this. But I think for some time after Brexit, we all lived in the hope that Brexit was not actually going to happen, that somehow something would happen and, and this would all be sort of a, a nightmare that we had had and, and we would not have to face Brexit. But the reality is that we are now in a situation where I think it's more certain than ever, in spite of the general election in the UK, that Brexit is going to happen. And we therefore have to, have to some, some extent, as the Chief Minister has said, carry on as normal. Because as normal for Gibraltarians has usually meant to having a fight. Having a fight with the UK, having a fight with Spain, having a fight with the EU, or with whoever it is we have had to have a fight to exert our rights. Rights which are often trodden upon, so the rights which are sometimes ignored, but rights which we have always fought for. And that is, I think, one of the fundamental aspects of what the Chief Minister was saying in a very nice way, which is that ultimately we have to engage with the UK government, that right now it is probably one of our only recourses, and that they have been doing so uh, diligently. I, that has led to the uh, creation of a joint ministerial committee, which I think is to be welcomed because it addresses the Gibraltar issue specifically. Um, and I think that the Chief Minister and other members today have made one point very clear, which is that the main issue that I think affects Gibraltar in the context of, in the context of Brexit is the frontier. I would dare say that if we were geographically placed elsewhere in the world, Brexit might not even be much of an issue for us because, um, as the Chief Minister said, not all is negative. There are opportunities to be derived. Uh, personally, I think there are opportunities to be derived from being outside of the EU. There are certain things wherein my, my legal hand, there are certain things we cannot do, certain services we cannot offer, certain products we cannot offer from a fiscal and economic regime that would be available outside of the EU and that might help us to make us competitive in, in that environment. So there are fiscal, there are economic, there are business opportunities available outside the EU, but of course we have to countenance with our neighbour, we have to countenance with the frontier. The Collective of Customs has just made extremely important points about how the fluidity of the lack of it could effectively mean a choke to the Gibraltar economy. And that is why I think it is important that what the government of Gibraltar is doing and what each of us can do is to engage with the UK government to make sure that our needs are heard. One important point that the Chief Minister made and that the ECAS Director CEO also made is that in theory at least Brexit should be about citizens. After all it was the citizens who voted for Brexit. I'm not entirely sure they knew what they were voting for but they voted for that and unfortunately I think Brexit has often happened in politics, often happens in politics, has been hijacked by political agendas, manifesto, uh, needs and I'm not sure that the citizens have been heard as much as perhaps they should have been heard in the context of Brexit and that, that's why I think that an event such as today is important, it's important to raise awareness, it's important to allow us to vent if, if nothing else and it is important to make us aware of the many new endos that apply to, to a Brexit scenario. Um, and that was, and, and Asiya mentioned that, and she said that we need to learn how to manage Brexit for the, for the benefit of its citizens. People are very worried, obviously. They, uh, ECAS was inundated with, with queries and comments immediately after Brexit. And the reality is that much as though we may want to offer 
answers and solutions to the problem, we, we don't know. Nobody knows what is going to happen. And that uncertainty is probably what causes us the greatest fear at this moment in time. But he has been here is important, and we need to make use of that. And I think today has been a good attempt to doing so. Because ECAS can be another voice of ours in Brussels. We need as much lobbying as we can get. Malachi then spoke briefly, but importantly, I think, in creating certain, uh, uh, or speaking of certain similarities between the Northern Ireland situation and ours, not least because they have a border which, as those of you who may be aware of, of the Irish history, the Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland history, that border is, and the fluidity of that border is perhaps not as important economically as it is for us, but it has ensured a prosperity of peace there that is extremely important as well in the context of a Brexit, and that needs to be preserved as well. We then heard from Marta, who, who I think very, very interestingly summarized the content of what is a, of a very useful report, which I, which I would urge you to, to read when you have time. It does, it does elucidate in much greater detail the very many points that are relevant to Brexit. Ultimately, however, what I, what I take from that report is that, yes, there are very many alternatives available to growth. So we have the Norway model, the Switzerland model, the Canada model, the Turkey model, and any other model we can invent. But ultimately, if any of these models or the implementation of those models involve the acquiescence or the collaboration of Spain, I think we need to be aware that such implementation is going to be hard because Spain has lost no time whatsoever in making it clear that they're going to try to take advantage of Brexit in as much as they can to try to um, further their claim, uh, the claim for sovereignty or the claim to just make our lives difficult. Um, and it is that what I hear in the many questions is frustration. What we hear is frustration because we have been let down by the Spaniards yet again or by the UK or by a, an EU situation which we have not chosen and in fact which we voted overwhelmingly against. Um, I just think I would sum up by saying that if there are certain key words that we can take from today, they, they are probably not pleasant words, but they are words such as, we're in a mess, nobody knows what's going on, we don't really have any coherent answers for anything, um, there is a lot of speculation going on, and the reality is that much as though we may want certainty, and I'm all for that, we cannot have it yet. If I may draw an analogy to, to, to a football match, this has just started, it's the first minute, and we may have had a, a goal scored against us, but there's a long uh, a long match left to be played and we need to see how that plays out so whereas I think it is understandable for all of us to seek assurances, to seek certainty, to seek clarity it's probably too early a stage for them. That is not to say however that we cannot pursue all of our opportunities and all any window that might open to us. But we should all leave today with some optimism, with some faith in the ability of the Gibraltarians to change and adapt. We have shown great resolve in the past and we should show that same resolve going ahead the journey ahead is certainly not going to be easy. We have never had it easy, so why should we have it easy going forward? But I think it is incumbent on all of us to have our voices heard, to put our voices out there, and for that reason I think that a, that a, a day like today is, is of crucial importance to us. And for that reason I'd like to thank ICAS once again for coming over, and I'd like to thank you all, because today would be useless if you were not here for us. But I think that, that the message that we really have to take from here is that our greatest fear is is vetoes and, and of course the consequences that we will expect from our friendly neighbour. But what we've seen in, in the in the draft and in clause 22 doesn't surprise us. And in fact, if you analyse it from a legalistic point of view, it doesn't really add anything because it's a power, it's a veto power that already existed. It it doesn't surprise us, and it shouldn't scare us either. We are used to our friendly neighbour. In fact, what we have endured from our neighbour for the last 300 years is probably what's made us stronger as a people. And it is that, I think, conditioning that we have as Gibraltarians that has prepared us for the two years that, that lie ahead. It won't be easy. We're not necessarily in the driving seat. Of course, as a government, we have uh, an overwhelming mandate. We know what the wishes of the Gibraltarian people are. It couldn't have been higher than, than a reflection in, in 96%. We are part of the discussion. As a government, of course, we will try and reach for the best outcome for Gibraltar.